pictures like these were shown for the first time, they were terrifying. Because taking the train once meant taking your life in your hands. The safety standards we take for granted took 150 years to evolve. And usually, it took a major disaster before anything was done. Rush hour in Washington, D.C. Commuters must choose between traffic jams or taking the train. One of the train systems serving the Maryland suburbs is known as the Mark Train. Eastbound routes from Brunswick approach Washington through the suburb of Silver Spring. This line also carries one of the country's busiest long-distance express trains, the Capital Limited, westbound Washington to Chicago. At 5.20 p.m. on February 16, 1996, the Capital Limited was preparing to depart. Its regular single daily run is still in the timetable today. 164 passengers boarded on the day in question. The travelers settled into their seats. Those going all the way to Chicago were looking at an 18 and a half hour journey. There was no reason to feel unsafe. The dinner menu occupied their attention as the express train gradually gathered speed. Mark Train 286 was a train like this, with single-deck passenger cars. On February 16th, there were only 20 passengers, many of them co-workers returning to Washington after a training course. Many were tired after a long day, the train rocking them almost to sleep. But they were on a collision course with an express train at a closing speed of 70 miles an hour. Train that derailed. It is on fire. Okay. Is it a freight train or is it a uh, passenger train? It looks train? like an Amtrak train. A passenger train derailed. From the first call, emergency response teams feared the worst. And it's on fire, you say? Yes. Okay, we're on the way for that. Neighbors couldn't believe the scene that was unfolding. I was, you know, looking out the windows. First thing I seen was just like train on top of train, fire, uh, smoke everywhere. Eleven passengers were killed. Some were crushed on impact. Others suffered a more terrible death. Trapped inside the marked train, doors jammed shut, the windows unbreakable. It was just burning, twisted, uh, you know, uh, was kids screaming. It was a very eerie scene, you know, kids coming in and out of smoke, banging on the window itself. A diesel tank on the express train had sheared off and burst, spraying fuel inside the marked train. I just jumped on the train and started kicking the windows and jumped down and tried to get rocks and threw at the windows. It would not break. This glass was impossible to break. Images of the disaster were on TV within minutes. As soon as I saw it on television, I knew I needed to respond. It was pretty clear as soon as we arrived on scene that the two trains hit each other at a crossover, a junction between tracks. In a situation like that, the, your first response is that there is a signals failure. What color signal was being displayed at the crucial moment? The answer was 700 miles away. Washington's signal system is run from a control room in Jacksonville, Florida. We determined that the signal system had functioned 
properly. It had displayed the proper signal for the Amtrak train was coming toward that signal and then going from one track to another track on a crossover. The Mark train uh, had a stop signal and he was supposed to have stopped in advance of the crossing. Investigators looked for any clue that might help explain the driver's actions. We considered that the weather could have been a factor. Because it was, in fact, snowing, maybe you couldn't see the signal. After talking with other engineers that had been in the area, um, we decided that the weather was not a factor either. All the fatalities were on the Mark train, including the driver and two crew members in the cab with him. For investigators, it was now pure detective work, but without the key witnesses. Again and again, investigators tried to relive the last few moments of Mark Train 286. What had the driver actually seen? First, a yellow warning signal, meaning prepare to stop at the next set of lights, two miles further down the track. Then, a stop at Kensington to pick up passengers. But why had the driver accelerated after a warning of danger ahead? This is what he saw approaching a blind bend at 60 miles an hour. Suddenly a signal showing red. The driver immediately hit the brakes. As a last desperate measure, he threw the train motor into reverse. But with this much track remaining, it was too late to stop. Confused and frustrated, and determined to discover why these trains crashed, investigators could only guess at the cause. But why, when the means of finding an answer are already available? By law, black box data recorders have been installed on all U.S. trains since 1996. They give a complete technical breakdown of a train's last journey and often provide vital evidence in piecing together events leading up to an accident. Of course, the black box must survive the immense forces unleashed when trains collide. This impact test simulates a head-on crash at 80 miles an hour. The steel casing must protect the delicate components inside. But that isn't the only factor in disasters like Silver Spring. The box is placed in a furnace designed to match the intense heat of a train fire, nearly 2,000 degrees for an hour. If the data is still readable after this abuse, the recorder is considered crashworthy. Data from the recorder in the marked train was anxiously examined in the hope it would provide the critical breakthrough. You can tell when the engineer is applying brakes, when he's changing speeds on the train. We looked at the train equipment itself and we found no problems with any of those things. You're reduced to trying to figure out why an experienced engineer, familiar with the territory, familiar with that particular run would disregard a signal. He's supposed to maintain a speed of no greater than 30 miles an hour prepared to stop. In fact, he got his speed as high as 66 miles an hour. What could have been the fatal distraction? No. Drivers deal with constant radio traffic from the control room and other trains. Records reveal that the conversation moments before the collision had to do with snowballs. There's some kids on the side of the track throwing snowballs at the train. So he contacts an oncoming Mark train, tells him that, watch out, there are some kids along the side of the track throwing snowballs. In the confusion, did the driver even see the yellow warning signal, then call it out to the conductor beside him as the rules require? 
we believe he called it out. We believe that he probably called it out correctly. Had we had a recording device that recorded voice, um, that would have captured those conversations. We would have known exactly what was said. Why can't they be sure? There's a surprising loophole in the safety law that prevents the black box from being fully effective. Cockpit voice recorders often explain why planes crash. Why not when trains crash? There are two problems with the voice recorders in the view of industry and labor. The crew are in a train up to 12 hours a day, day in, day out. There are many times that they have just general conversations, personal, private, whatever. And the concern is that this information would be used to charge the employee for certain violations of railroad regulations. Now the industry side would have a concern because if I am injured in an accident and I have access to this recorder and here we have hours of chatting about the baseball game or a football game, you can see how that would play in front of a jury. If I were a rail manager, I would certainly have concern about it. In the U.S., voice recorders top the wish list for accident investigators. This loophole in the law may mean the cause of these deaths will forever remain an unsolved mystery, and so will the causes of other disasters in the future. If a train weighing 20,000 tons is heading your way at 60 miles an hour and it gets this close, understand, it's not going to stop. What makes train travel so unique makes it dangerous too. Steel wheels on steel rails minimize friction to maximize speed. It's a massive trade-off against safety. A gamble which the earliest railway pioneers quickly recognized. What happens when you try to stop the train, when friction is vital? At that point, steel on steel is the last thing you need. Because trains have such long stopping distances, they need plenty of warning when danger is present. Yellow signals mean stark braking. The next signal, maybe more than a mile away, will be red. century, something called ATC, Automatic Train Control, was introduced. It alerted drivers to yellow signals. A ramp between the tracks sent a magnetic impulse to a sensor underneath the train. That sensor was linked to a visual display in the cab known as the sunflower dial. When a ramp was passed, the sunflower turned black and an alarm sounded. The driver then had to override the alarm or the brakes would go on automatically. This simple system was ahead of its time. Companies said it was too costly to install. Fifty years passed before two huge disasters underlined the need for this kind of warning device when Why Trains Crash continues. In 1952, 112 passengers were killed in a devastating three-train pileup at Harrow, outside London. In 1957, 90 passengers were killed when two trains crashed at Lewisham in southeast London. In both cases, drivers had ignored yellow warning signals. There was a public outcry, and the widespread introduction of automatic train control, or ATC, was mandated. A similar device is still in use today, hardly altered 100 years after it was first invented. Its biggest weakness is that drivers can become so used to canceling the alarm 
that it might as well not be there. But alternatives are costly. During recent years, there has been an increasing uh, tendency on the part of the relevant decision makers to employ what I as an economist would regard as uh, legitimate cost-benefit methods in the assessment of rail safety. The key question today isn't which safety device works best, but how much does it cost? Exactly how much are we willing to spend to prevent rail disaster fatalities? Other countries wrestle with the same cost-benefit analysis. One figure that the British train companies have come up with as the price of saving one life is three million pounds. That's about four and a half million dollars. But there's a problem with this way of thinking. Lots of people have to die to prove that a safety system is worth installing. In hard-nosed terms, the more corpses there are, the more likely it is to be undertaken. All safety systems are an attempt to compensate for human error. After all, it was a case of bad judgment that led to the worst rail disaster the world had ever seen. June 12, 1889, was a bright summer day on a small branch line in Northern Ireland. Yet this would be the site that exposed the dangers of rail travel like no place before or since, marking it as the location for the darkest day in railroad history. The victims were the children of Armagh, and they thought this was going to be the happiest day of the year. A lot of the Sunday school children who would go to the various churches would never get a day away and one of the great treats at the end of the year was to give them a free day by the seaside. Just over 600 children were on board the seaside special, steaming up the gentle hills surrounding Armagh. But they'd never reached the seaside. On a hill a little steeper than the rest, passengers felt the train begin to slow down. It stopped. Suddenly, it became a runaway train, running backwards. It simply went on gathering speed, and some of those who realized what was happening were actually able to climb out of the windows and jump. The train was hurtling backwards, downhill, out of control. It looked as though it might run all the way back into Armagh. But another train was speeding uphill on the same line. The wooden carriages smashed uh, into smithereens. Wreckage and people, bodies, went down the embankment. They brought the soldiers from the barracks out to help and all the local doctors uh, gathered round and they brought the casualties into the city hospital and the dead into the courthouse. In the tangled wreckage of the seaside special, rescuers found 80 bodies. Most of them were children. Well, it was devastating. Armagh is a small city. It was a small city then. There was hardly a family that wouldn't have been affected. Some whole families were wiped out. With its two cathedrals, Armagh is the religious capital of Northern Ireland. Prayers were said for the children here and all over the British Empire. Queen Victoria sent money to help pay for the funerals. The press and the public demanded to know why the trains had crashed. This disaster compares in railway terms with what the Titanic was to shipping. And it came shortly after Parliament had refused to introduce some of the safety measures on railways because the railways claimed they would all cost too much. The impact which this dreadful accident had was enormous. Public opinion was outraged. And the railway inspectorate, who overlooked railway safety, 
they were also outraged because for many years they've been pressing the railway companies to improve their safety systems but they didn't have the power to insist suddenly the railroads were on trial at an inquiry in Armagh Courthouse, investigators revealed an incredible story of criminal negligence. To sell more tickets, three extra coaches had been coupled to the seaside special at the last minute. All the doors were locked to keep the children in and freeloaders out. The driver warned that his engine couldn't pull the weight, but he was ordered to go with a train that could barely struggle out of the station. The train set off, and uh, immediately it was faced with a gradient of 1 in 75, which in road terms is, is nothing, but in railway terms it is a steep gradient. Uh, the train laboured at this long uh, 1 in 75 gradient until it was almost at the top, only about 200 yards from the summit. When the engine stalled, because it just didn't have enough power to drag the whole heavy train over the top. The train crew then said, what shall we do now? The driver had been right, but there was no turning back. And his next decision proved fatal. The train crew would divide the train in two, take the first section up to the top of the hill, put it in a siding, the engine would come back to the second portion and take it up to the top and they'd recouple the two parts together and go on their way. The second portion didn't immediately run back because the brake was on in the guard's van. The train crew were a bit worried about leaving the train on the gradient and they placed stones on top of the rail behind the wheels, several stones. Everything would have been okay because the stones and the guards brake held the second portion. As the engine started to take the first five coaches up the hill, the train just eased back slightly. A single handbrake wasn't sufficient to hold the train. The second portion started to run back initially very slowly. So slowly, in fact, the train crew could walk alongside it. But then it increased speed faster and faster. You can imagine the terror that was developing in this runaway train. Why did 600 lives depend on a handful of stones? The coaches all had brakes powered by a steam pipe from the locomotive. Normally, steam forced the brake shoes against the wheels, slowing them down. But when the driver split the train, he also had to separate the steam pipe. All the brake power was gone. A much safer system had already been invented. It worked on the same principle, but in reverse. Brakes were sprung permanently against the wheel unless there was steam power to free them. So whenever a train was split, or if power to the braking system failed for any reason, the brakes came on automatically. That's what it means to fail safe. Still, the disaster didn't need to happen. Why was another train speeding along on a line that was already blocked? In the early days of railways, when there were no means of communication between stations, there had to be some means of letting trains follow each other, one after the other, and keeping a safe interval between them. Generally speaking, after five minutes had elapsed, after a train had gone, a second train would be allowed to go after the driver had been cautioned and told that there was a train in front of him only five minutes away. Not a very safe system if a train breaks down in midsection. But a more modern signaling system had already been tried out on some lines. 
It used the electric telegraph to send messages between signal boxes. It made managing a railway as safe and simple as running a train set. Sections of track between signal boxes were known as blocks. When a train passed a signal box, the signal would go up and remain there until the train had cleared the block. The next train on the line would see the signal and have to stop. Only when the first train reached the next signal box would a message be sent saying the block was now clear and the train behind could proceed. Block working, as it was called, dividing railways into sections with signals at either end, set a safety standard adopted around the world. It's still in use today. Colored lights have replaced the signal arm, but the principle is exactly the same. Today, signal controllers sit in command centers often hundreds of miles from the signal itself. They control the train's journey through each block, these rectangles of light on a screen. It had taken 70 years in the disaster at Armagh to realize the need for proper signals and brakes. But that disaster also revealed the danger of building trains that shattered and splintered into matchsticks in a collision. There were lessons to be learned here, too. How long would that take? What are our chances of surviving a train crash today? when Why Trains Crash continues. Experience is a cruel but effective teacher. It took decades and many disasters to develop safe signals and brakes, but accidents weren't eliminated. The death toll went on rising because railway pioneers overlooked a vital factor. How to build trains which limit destruction so passengers have a chance of survival when the worst happens. The journey has been a long and painful process. The Eurostar, on its way from Paris to London, is designed for speed and safety. Near Staplehurst, it crosses a narrow bridge where all the dangers of the early railways were cruelly exposed. Long before the Eurostar, a southeastern railway express brought passengers returning from France on exactly the same route. The boat train, as it's known, connected passengers from the cross-channel ferry at Folkestone. This was 1865 and railways were still a new, developing technology. The boat train's top speed of 45 miles an hour was something to marvel at. But how would it survive a crash? On June 9th, repairs were taking place on the bridge over the narrow river Bult. Workmen had begun removing old rails and replacing them with new ones. And this was quite a small bridge. Um, over a muddy stream and rails were fitted on the top of the longitudinal timbers. Now the gang of men were changing these rails and it almost finished the job, only one little more to do. Now here is a, a potentially dangerous situation. There's no rails. If a train comes along then you've got, obviously got a disaster. At first the train crew couldn't understand why there were people on the line. There was no repair work scheduled at that time. The workmen heard the whistle. The new rails were still not in place. They rushed to warn the train. Too late. Ten passengers were crushed to death in the wreckage of the boat train.
I was in the only carriage that did not go over into the stream. It hung suspended in an apparently impossible manner. A survivor described the horror in a letter to a friend. I got out with great caution. Suddenly I came upon a man covered with blood. I couldn't bear to look at him. Then I stumbled over a lady lying on her back, with the blood streaming over her face. The next time I passed her, she was dead. In writing these words of recollection, I feel the shake, and I'm obliged to stop. Ever faithfully, Charles Dickens. He had been travelling back from France, um, where he'd been uh, for, for a number of weeks. He'd been finishing manuscripts for Our Mutual Friend, which would be his last completed novel, and caught the boat train. The fact that he had so narrowly escaped, and it was a very, very narrow escape for him, was, was quite a remarkable story. Detailed etchings were made of, of the accident and showing Dickens moving among the wounded, tending them. It was the most sensational accident in the industry's then brief history. The question on everyone's lips, why had the boat train met with disaster? Because the train purely met the ferry from France, it left at a different time every day, changing every day because of the tides, of course. So a very complicated set of timetables was drawn up to take account for that. And the foreman of the works obviously got the wrong one. He had sent a man down the track with a red flag to warn any oncoming train before it got to the bridge. Now, the man positioned himself purely by counting telegraph poles. Now, on this stretch of line, the telegraph poles were closer together than they were on a standard railway line, so he wasn't far enough back. All of these little incidences contrived to make sure that the train was coming over the bridge that wasn't completed at that time. The public was shocked by a crash that nearly killed the most famous man of his time. There was an investigation, but one key witness remained silent. Charles didn't go to the inquiry because he, he needed to keep very quiet about his traveling companions. Uh, he was traveling with a young lady by the name of Ellen Turnham, and Ellen was, in fact, his mistress. With his position in society, he just couldn't afford for that fact to come out. But Victorian society wouldn't have accepted that at all. In this crash, human error played its part. But why had a derailment so quickly turned into a disaster? What part did design play in the destruction of the boat train? The couplings which held the train together were purely a screw coupling which went over a hook and in this accident particularly it wasn't strong enough to bear the forces exerted when the second and succeeding coaches fell into the stream. The screw coupling just snapped. Early in the 20th century a new type of coupling known as a Buckeye coupling was devised which was far stronger than the screw coupling and far less liable to break in two following a collision. And uh, certainly in recent times, it's enabled trains to remain intact and upright following derailments. Why did the carriages offer so little protection? When the early railways came along, they were just stagecoaches on rails. The idea of having an all-steel coach didn't emerge until the 20th century, or half a century later. But why would it take decades and many more disasters before safety became a factor in design? Trains built from stronger materials would be heavier and slower. They'd use more coal and carry less payload. For the owners, trains would cost more and earn less. So they resisted safety laws. Everywhere, railways were expanding rapidly but so was the cost in human lives. In 1890 alone, more than 6,000 people were killed in train crashes. That's almost 20 a day. 
Only when safety coincided with good business sense did the death toll decline. Stronger couplings allowed faster, heavier freight and passenger trains. In the 1930s, steel carriages began to appear. By the 1950s, they were a standard feature on most railways. They were safer, but they also lasted longer. That made them more economical than the old wooden ones. A modern passenger train doesn't look very much like the boat train of Charles Dickens' time. Designers believe they've made this train almost indestructible. That would be put to the test in an amazing series of accidents on one of the world's great railway journeys. When Why Trains Crash continues. Route 66, the road that first bridged America in 1935. But the railroad got here first. This line, sweeping through the Arizona desert, was laid out in 1883. It's one of the driest places in the world. But these bridges were built to protect against flash floods. Flood waters should pass under the line, leaving the tracks undamaged. But if a bridge failed, how would a train cope today? This is also the route of America's most famous transcontinental passenger train. The Southwest Chief runs from Los Angeles to Chicago. 2,220 miles in two days. Los Angeles, Grand Union Station. On the evening of August 8, 1997, 294 passengers made their way onto the waiting train. They settled in for a long trip. The Southwest Chief rushed through California, crossing the Arizona state line in the early hours of the morning. At 5.30 a.m., a stop to change crews at the small railroad town of Kingman. Nothing unusual about this run, except the weather. Under flash flooding from torrential rains, the bridges were being tested, including one just east of Kingman. The railroad did dispatch an inspector in order to uh, assess the bridge, make a visual inspection. Just prior to when the chief passed over that particular bridge, a freight train had passed by that site going the opposite direction, that is going westbound, and there was no apparent damage to the bridge. Like the boat train 112 years earlier, the southwest chief was heading blindly into danger. Instead of 45 miles an hour, this train was doing 90 as it thundered toward the bridge. The locomotive crew did see the dip in the track, but of course uh, they were far too close to stop before crossing the bridge. Dawn revealed a scene of devastation. Amid panic and confusion, rescuers radioed for additional help. Early reports had at least eight passengers dead, many more injured. The torrent had washed away most of the bridge, leaving just the metal rails to support the weight of the train. Where the timber supports had been, now one of the Southwest Chief's sleeper cars straddled the gap. But as the sun climbed higher, everyone at the scene began to view things in a new light. Doctors took a head count at Kingman High School, where the injured had been taken, 
a passenger list was found. Then they counted again. In their astonishment, everyone was safely accounted for. What had seemed like a disaster began to look more like a miracle. The Southwest Chief had won this battle with the elements, but this was just round one. Earthquake. On October 16, 1999, a severe earthquake, seven on the Richter scale, shook California. The epicenter was in the Mojave Desert, a hundred miles east of Los Angeles. It struck at two in the morning, exactly when the Southwest Chief was passing through. The train was shaken right off the tracks. Rescuers could hardly believe that once again, no one was killed in this derailment at 60 miles an hour. Four people were injured, but the battered carriages remained upright. Surely this train had passed the tests. Not yet. On March 15th, 2000, at two in the morning, the Southwest Chief crashed for the third time. It was rounding a bend at 60 miles an hour when it left the tracks near Topeka, Kansas. There were 155 passengers and crew on board. 35 went to the hospital, but no one was killed. Three high-speed crashes in three years. What saved the passengers on the Southwest Chief? The principal thing is that the train did remain intact. The couplers are very effective in keeping the cars together. They are very effective in uh, essentially keeping the whole train together. These couplings were designed to survive a derailment at 90 miles an hour, a huge advance on earlier designs. The earlier uh, couplers that were used in passenger equipment uh, allowed substantial vertical motion. Matter of fact, they were pretty much unrestrained. Uh, if you took uh, a car that was in the middle of a train and tried to lift it up, you'd have no difficulty doing that. One might expect, if you had those kinds of couplers, that the, the cars would indeed come undone. Uh, and you'd essentially end up with a large pile of what used to be uh, passenger cars. The carriages were also a state-of-the-art design, built with a collision in mind. You have the strong part of the cars that can crush in a controlled fashion, which hopefully should limit uh, the amount of injuries and the severity of injuries uh, that an occupant might experience during a collision. To cross half of the country, the Southwest Chief has to carry huge amounts of fuel, 2,000 gallons in a single tank. Fire can turn a derailment into a disaster, but the train had fuel tanks of a brand new design. And this particular train has fuel tanks which are located up inside the car body itself rather than a frame suspended fuel tank which we've seen on earlier equipment. Having more ground clearance provides for space that the debris and, and track that is damaged in a derailment to harmlessly pass beneath the locomotive and hence not puncture the fuel tank. It may be the unluckiest train in the world, but it just might be the toughest too. The Southwest Chief proved the benefits of designing for a disaster, proved how far we've come in the 150 years since the boat train ran off the bridge and shattered into pieces. Railroads have changed the world. They've come to symbolize the inventive energy of the 19th century. They helped shape the 20th century. They're certain to play a role in the 21st. But on the day railroad service began, September 15, 1830, amid all the celebrations of the launch of the world's first passenger line, could they have missed a warning of things to come? The man who'd organized it all, William Huskisson, became the very first accident victim. The locomotive rocket ran him over. The amazing new machine didn't have any brakes. He died. 
the first lesson was learned. But soon, there'd be many, many more lives on the line. I knew I needed to respond. It was pretty clear as soon as we arrived on scene that the two trains hit each other at a crossover, a junction between tracks. In a situation like that, the, your first response is that there is a signal's failure. What color signal was being displayed at the crucial moment? The answer was 700 miles away. Washington's signal system is run from a control room in Jacksonville, Florida. We determined that the signal system had functioned properly. It had displayed the proper signal for the Amtrak train was coming toward that signal and then going from one track to another track on a crossover. The Mark train uh, had a stop signal and he was supposed to have stopped in advance of the crossing. Investigators looked for any clue that might help explain the driver's actions. We considered that the weather could have been a factor because it was in fact snowing. Maybe you couldn't see the signal. After talking with other engineers that had been in the area, um, we decided that the weather was not a factor either. All the fatalities were on the Mark train, including the driver and two crew members in the cab with him. For investigators, Pictures like these were shown for the first time. They were terrifying. Because taking the train once meant taking your life in your hands. The safety standards we take for granted took 150 years to evolve. And usually, it took a major disaster before anything was done. hour in Washington DC. Commuters must choose between traffic jams or taking the train. One of the train systems serving the Maryland suburbs is known as the Mark train. Eastbound routes from Brunswick approach Washington through the suburb of Silver Spring. This line also carries one of the country's busiest long-distance express trains, the Capital Limited, westbound Washington to Chicago. At 5.20 p.m. on February 16, 1996, the Capital Limited was preparing to depart. Its regular single daily run is still in the timetable today. 164 passengers boarded on the day in question. The travelers settled into their seats. Those going all the way to Chicago were looking at an 18 and a half hour journey. There was no reason to feel unsafe. The dinner menu occupied their attention as the express train gradually gathered speed. Mark Train 286 was a train like this, with single-deck passenger cars. On February 16th, there were only 20 passengers, many of them co-workers returning to Washington after a training course. Many were tired after a long day, the train rocking them almost to sleep. But they were on a collision course with an express train at a closing speed of 70 miles an hour. It was now pure detective work, but without the key witnesses. 
Again and again, investigators tried to relive the last few moments of Mark Train 286. What had the driver actually seen? First, a yellow warning signal, meaning prepare to stop at the next set of lights, two miles further down the track. Then, a stop at Kensington to pick up passengers. But why had the driver accelerated after a warning of danger ahead? This is what he saw approaching a blind bend at 60 miles an hour. Suddenly a signal showing red. The driver immediately hit the brakes. As a last desperate measure, he threw the train motor into reverse. But with this much track remaining, it was too late to stop. Confused and frustrated, and determined to discover why these trains crashed, investigators could only guess at the cause. But why, when the means of finding an answer are already available? By law, black box data recorders have been installed on all U.S. trains since 1996. They give a complete technical... Fire department, okay. Okay. there's a train that derailed, it is on fire. Okay. Is it a freight train or is it a uh, passenger train? It looks train? like an Amtrak train. A passenger train derailed. From the first call, emergency response teams feared the worst. And it's on fire, you say? Yes. Okay, we're on the way for that. Neighbors couldn't believe the scene that was unfolding. I was, you know, looking out the windows, first thing I seen was just like train on top of train, fire, uh, smoke everywhere. Eleven passengers were killed. Some were crushed on impact. Others suffered a more terrible death, trapped inside the marked train, doors jammed shut, the windows unbreakable. It was just burning, twisted, uh, you know, uh, it was kids screaming. It was a very eerie scene, you know, kids coming in and out of smoke, banging on the window itself. A diesel tank on the express train had sheared off and burst, spraying fuel inside the marked train. I just jumped on the train and started kicking the windows and jumped down and tried to get rocks and threw at the windows. It would not break. This glass is impossible to break. Images of the disaster were on TV within minutes. As soon as I saw it on television, 